afternoon and welcome to HUD. I am uh, so excited uh, to be here today with Dr. Jeff Brenner. And I think that you'll see uh, very soon why it is, and I am confident that you will share uh, my excitement by the time we're done here today. Um, I don't think that any single person in America has so crystallized the importance of the relationship between health and housing as Dr. Brenner and his team in Camden, New Jersey. No pressure. Um, so with us today, we have uh, a, a fair number of people from HUD, and uh, great to have you here. One of our goals is to help uh, raise the dialogue within HUD about the relationship between housing and health, and to understand something about what's happening in that healthcare system that's out there or down the street, however you think about it. We also do have some guests here from HHS. And, um, you know, of course, we're constantly trying to make sure that our friends at HHS understand the fundamental role that housing stability plays in improving uh, the health, not only of our residents, uh, but the health of people that don't have a home. So, uh, so very glad uh, to have uh, members of HHS here. I think that we might have uh, some folks from some other agencies. I know the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness is here. We might have some friends from the Office of Management and Budget. And I understand we also might have a staff person here from Senator uh, Booker's uh, office, uh, the, the New Jersey uh, senator. So welcome to everybody uh, who is here today. And uh, I simply want to say that when I first read Atul Gawande's article, The Hot Spotters, in The New Yorker, when it came out, I think in February of 2011, I was reading about the intervention that Dr. Brenner is going to talk about, about what did they do when they identified the patients who were the highest cost to the, to the Camden healthcare system. And when they talked about the level of engagement and the way that they engaged people in thinking differently about their health, I thought to myself, this engagement strategy sounds exactly like what we've learned in the last 20 years around engaging people who have been living on the streets for a long time. That in order to engage people to, to, to approach their life and their care and their health differently, you can't do it from within your box or within your silo. You have to go out and you have to get into people's lives and you have to find out what's going on with them. You have to find out what happened to them. So to be able to translate that experience into uh, one is one, what is one of the hottest topics in health reform right now, um, I just want you to have the experience of hearing uh, from Dr. Jeff Brenner. Please give him a warm HUD welcome. Thank you, such a nice introduction. Thank you so much. It's such a pleasure to be here today, and um, I'm really looking forward to learn learning from all of you in the room. Uh, I'm a family doctor. Um, my vision for my life was to work in an underserved community, uh, and after residency, I moved from downtown Seattle to downtown Camden and lived there for about eight years and also uh, worked as a frontline family doctor, so saw kids, adults, and delivered babies at, at our local hospital and did lots of home visits. And Working in a small underserved office is like having a focused group of all the failures in underserved communities because if there's a failure in the criminal justice system and the housing system and education, you quickly find out about it as your patients come in and, uh, and share their stories. So I want to start by uh, showing you, let's see, showing you my office so you get a sense of, of what I did and, and, and uh, where I worked. This was a small three exam room office in a neighborhood called East Camden. And uh, it was a beautiful office. It had three exam rooms. It had gorgeous IKEA furniture, amazing art on the walls, uh, wonderful, peaceful, tranquil music when you walked in. And I saw people uh, who were Medicaid, uh, mostly. And I speak Spanish, so I took care of a whole spectrum of very, very large families. Um, I was very happy here, but unfortunately, there's no business model for this and for what I do. And that's going to be a core uh, comment of what I talk about today. Uh, my office is currently boarded up and closed because my Medicaid rates kept falling. So uh, when I started out, I made enough in Medicaid to, to have a business and to run this office. By the time my office had to close, I was making $19 to $35 a visit. And you have to run pretty fast from room to room to room to make that up in volume. At the same time that my office um, ended up boarded up and closed, uh, we expanded our emergency rooms. They tripled in size. We built new wings on the acute hospitals. We hired more specialists. We bought more gamma knives. We built out our NICUs. So there was money in the delivery system, but how we allocated that money and what we did with it was to um, build bigger and bigger acute systems while primary care in underserved communities 
all over America, all over New Jersey, and throughout Camden have more and more boarded up offices just like this. I wouldn't be here. I, I, it's great that I'm here with all of you. I would much rather still be in my primary care office. Um, you know, urban communities reclaim things. So my office is slowly being reclaimed. It would be like having, um, you know, ruins in a jungle if you've been to Tikal in Guatemala. So the city is slowly reclaiming uh, my empty building. Uh, the back of it is uh, currently burned out and it's uh, boarded up as well. So let's talk about um, how I got started in this. Um, I learned a lot from community organizing and from uh, colleagues that run a group called Camden Churches Organized for People in Camden. And uh, very early on befriended some of their leadership and, and learned about community organizing and realized that my community of disgruntled, angry primary care doctors was a very disorganized group that we didn't know each other, <laughs> and we didn't know how to work together. So we put something together called the Camden City Health Provider Breakfast Group. And um, uh, literally every couple of months we got together, and these were all older primary care docs who'd worked in Camden for many, many years in little tiny offices who were slowly going out of business and slowly going bankrupt. We got together and found out we had a lot in common. Whenever you get doctors together, we mostly sit around and complain, and that's, that's what we did. And eventually, after doing that for three years, formed up into a nonprofit organization, and we called it the Camden Coalition of Healthcare Providers. It was originally going to be like the Camden Medical Group, but we quickly realized that the, some of the most important players at the table were nurses and social workers, and that we really needed some kind of a broader framework for this. Our early vision was really just to save ourselves, and that didn't work very well, obviously, because most of those providers, a bunch of them are dead. Uh, they are older, retired, their offices are boarded up as well. So we didn't save ourselves, but I think in the process of this, we invented a new way of talking about the problem at least. Uh, one of the things that we got a hold of is uh, frontline billing data from the three local hospitals. This was very much inspired by people who came down that had reformed uh, the police department in New York City. So disciples of Bratton who'd come to Camden to help us reinvent and reform our police department. And I got the chance to get to know them and, and learn a whole lot about the, the data and the new management concepts that were deployed in policing and thought that a lot of those could apply to healthcare as well. We were a large, unaccountable system producing no outcomes and spending a lot of money, which is the same problem that policing up in New York was having as well. So um, we got a hold of, we have three emergency rooms, two inpatient hospitals, about now 15 primary care locations in the city of Camden. We're nine square miles, 79,000 people. We're the first, second, or third poorest city in the country, and currently the most dangerous city in the country. Three of our last six mayors have been indicted and convicted of corruption. At one point, we were incredibly wealthy. We were the Seattle of our day, producing phonographs, producing recorded music, producing radios, televisions, most of the ships for World War I, World War II. Capitalism is a powerful force, and it creates and destroys. And uh, we were hollowed out. We had no knowledge industries to fall back on. So the data set that we got a hold of is very unusual. This would be a little bit like Target, Kmart, and Walmart in one community, allowing you to get all their customer data, put it into one database, and then convince those customers to stop shopping there. <laughs> and and disgruntled people like me, frontline primary care doctors, never get a hold of data sets like this. This is very, very unusual. So we quickly learned that half the population goes to an emergency room or hospital. We learned that someone had actually gone 113 times in a year. We learned that someone had gone 324 times in five years. Up in the city of Trenton, there's a homeless woman in her 50s who went 450 times in one year. She went more than once a day to the local hospitals and local emergency rooms. So far, Trenton gets the award for having the leading high utilizer in the country. It turns out that we spend, the number's gone up, it's actually $108 million a year to hospitalize Camden City residents over and over and over. And I wouldn't be here today if I thought we were spending your tax dollars well. So we're spending the American public's tax dollars very, very poorly. And there's no new money coming. We're living in an age of austerity that's not going away. And we're going to have to have some very hard discussions about how we're spending that money. 
As a country, we spend $2.8 trillion. We spend 18% of our, of our country's wealth on healthcare. As we look forward into the future, that's stabilized recently, but with 85 million baby boomers in the midst of retiring, 10,000 people turn 65 every day, we're looking at a tsunami that humankind has never seen before. We have never lived through times of having such a large proportion of our population aging, and it will change everything. Everything we know will change, and costs will begin to go up, and as many of you know, the bulk of the long-term federal debt in America is healthcare, healthcare, and healthcare. So a big challenge for business in America right now is increasing healthcare spending. A huge challenge for families is healthcare spending as well. The great task to tackle in the next 10 years, now that we've made a decision to cover a lot more people, is what are we buying? And are we buying good care? And are we buying affordable care? And we haven't answered that question. It's a much harder task. So when I look at $108 million a year that we spend in Camden, what I see in that $108 million, 1% of that money, $1 million, would hire four of me and open up offices. We only have 16 primary care offices in Camden, really, 16 to 20. That would be a 25% increase in the primary care supply in Camden. That would hire um, you know, probably 10 outreach nurses. That would hire 15 or 20 community health workers. I could put diabetic education in every public housing site in Camden for that kind of money and have more left over. So you know, we're going to have to think really hard about how we're spending our dollars and how we begin to change the dialogue and we move those dollars around. You know, and, and all of you know enough to know when you move dollars around, you create winners and losers. You know, this is going to be very painful uh, discussions going forward. The most expensive single person had $3.5 million in payments for their care. That was a Medicare patient going back over and over. 30% of the costs go to 1% of the patients. 80% of the cost to 13% of the patients, and 90% of the cost to 20% of the patients. That's called a Pareto curve. And the basic idea, this 80-20 rule, is true in every human system. If you go into a school, and you go into a classroom, there are two or three kids in every classroom whose learning styles are different and don't fit into the average of the classroom and are driving much of the discipline. If you go into a school, there are a few families that are driving much of the problems in the school and in the principal's office all the time. If you go into a community, there are a few families and kids that are committing much of the crimes and shooting one another. If you go into a housing project, there are a few uh, tenants in those housing projects that are driving many of the problems. Our problem in all of our human systems is that we do a terrible job of creating systems that pivot day to day to the complexities of the needs of the outliers. The outliers are the ones that confound us all the time. And we struggle with the language, we struggle with the systems, we struggle with the design of how, what we're going to do for those outliers. And this is very true in healthcare as well. It's also true if you look at, a, um, if you look at all HUD employees and their dependents. A small number of HUD employees and dependents are driving most of the health spend within your population. If you look at any population, draw a line around it, pull out all the health spending and health utilization, you will find the same basic pattern. And in healthcare, we march along every day with a sort of one-size-fits-all model. And you know, I have a, a hammer in primary care, and it's called the 10-minute primary care visit. And you get it no matter who you are. If you have a head cold, if you are in a wheelchair, you've recently had open heart surgery, you speak Spanish, you don't, um, you don't understand anything that's happened to you, you've recently been discharged from the hospital, we don't have any of the records, all your meds have been changed, I still have that 10 or 15 minute visit. If I stay in that room more time, I may as well hand that patient a $20 bill, then a $30 bill, then a $50 bill. So I'm essentially making a choice to close my office and board the office up for every minute I stay in that room and do the right thing. That's the choices that we're presenting primary care doctors every day. They make more money treating head colds than by treating sick patients. The way healthcare makes money is by taking those very sick people and running them through all the expensive parts of the healthcare system when you cut, scan, zap, and hospitalize them. We pay far more per minute, per hour, if you cut, scan, zap, and hospitalize your family than if you talk to someone. 
So when you're frustrated, when you're sitting in the waiting room, when you're calling that office and can't get an appointment, when you're sitting in the exam room and you're angry that that primary care doctor, or frankly any doctor, rushed in and rushed out and didn't listen to you, that's because we have a deep and profound bias built into our delivery system. If you pay too much for something, you will get too much of it. You will get too many hospital beds, too many emergency rooms, too many scanners, too many NICUs, too many specialists. If you don't pay enough for something else, no one will listen to you. You won't get an appointment. You will wait too long. And the primary care provider or cardiologist or nephrologist will go running out of the room. They don't make money from talking to you. They make money from putting you through the scanner that they've leased and put in their office. When they say we need to check another echo on your mom because she hasn't an echo in two months, that's how they made their money, not from talking to you. Conversations with people in America in the healthcare system are the loss leader that we use to get you into our beds and into our scanners and onto our pills. That's a deep problem. We're this far into the Affordable Care Act and we haven't had that conversation. The number one reason to go to an emergency room in Camden is head colds. There were 12,000 visits for head colds. There were 7,000 visits for ear infections, seven for viral infection, six for sore throats, five for asthma, on and on. So these are all primary care problems that could very easily be treated in my office. These are poor moms and kids with Medicaid cards sitting in emergency rooms in Camden for two, four, six hours waiting to get taken care of. The choice architecture that we built in the American healthcare system and in Medicaid is broken. I've heard many people say, well, poor people like to sit in the emergency room. There is a very clear category of people who do like to sit in the emergency room. If it's 10 degrees below zero and you live in Tent City in Camden and you are hungry, the emergency room is a great place to be. If you're a mom with kids and poor middle class or upper class, the emergency room is a miserable place to be. Most poverty in America is poor moms and kids. Most people who sit in emergency rooms in America are not uninsured. They have insurance, they just don't have better options. You know, even you, when you call your primary care office, get put on hold, leave a message, wait all day to get called back, have to argue to the front desk about getting in. Can you imagine if you were in a Medicaid office? I challenge you to pick up the phone right now and call any key Medicaid provider, safety net provider in your community and see how well you get in. It will take you a long time to get in. We're a big believer in segmentation, segmentation. The healthcare world uses data in all of the wrong ways. We use data in very linear ways. We talk about risk stratification. We try and stretch people out as if you could make a, a line of people from sickest to healthiest. Advertisers would never do that. Advertisers segment data. They break it out in much more complex ways. This is one example of segmentation. This is geographic segmentation. Hotspotting is not making maps. Hotspotting is tearing a data, apart, a, a data set apart and looking for outliers and then doing root cause analysis with the outliers. That's what Bratton was doing. Fundamentally, he was shifting the management model of the police department to focus on the few outliers that were committing all the crimes. One tool he used for that was maps. He used many other tools for that as well. So please don't walk out thinking that hotspotting is making maps. It's not. It's one tool to understand the outliers. And this is the long, messy tail of data, the messy, nonlinear part of the data set. If you get a data analyst who brings back means and averages, they've done the wrong thing for you. The people who tell you the most about a broken system are the outliers. So the, the messy, long part of the data. So this is a map of the city of Camden with Cooper, Lords, and Virtuos, emergency room and hospital data, combined together into one data set in overlaying the payments to the hospitals. This is not charges. Charges are the bills that are sent out. Receipts are the payments that came back. This is real dollars that they were paid to take care of poor people. This is mostly your tax dollars at work. Because it's such a poor community, this is mostly Medicaid and Medicare. Mapping it out over five years, it's only a nine square mile city. The red areas on the map are called census blocks, very small geographies. 6% of the census blocks are 10% of the landmass, 18% of the patients, 27% of the visits, and 37% of the payments to the hospitals for the care of those patients. So essentially what you find in America, and frankly all over America, everywhere we've looked, is that high cost complex patients 
get collected into specific geographic patterns and often live in buildings that you guys are managing or that you in some way are funding. And I'll show you proof of that in a second. These are the two most expensive buildings in the city of Camden. These buildings are extremely well managed by very idealistic people who care deeply about the populations. These are not scary urban public housing buildings. The building at the at top is run by someone named Peter O'Connor in Fair Share Housing. It's a beautiful building uh, called Northgate 2. 600 patients live in the building. They are mostly dual eligible. So these are Medicare, people of Medicare and Medicaid. They're older, disabled. And uh, they had 12 million in payments for going back over and over to the hospital. The bu building at the bottom is a subacute rehab and nursing home with 300 patients who had 15 million in payments to go back over and over and over. We've spent a huge amount of time uh, in these buildings and in buildings similar to them, asking residents to tell us their stories. And we brought some of them uh, here to meet you today. Um, Anthony Phoenix, Anthony, and Anna. Uh, so when you ask me questions, I may turn around and ask them to answer the question. Uh, what we learned in the building is that these buildings could be uh, a 600 miles away from healthcare. We have an academic health center that is receiving incredible public subsidy, only six blocks away, and you'd think it was 600 miles away. So, and we'll get into some of those stories in a bit. I'll give you a small taste of the kind of things we see. We had a diabetic patient going over and over to the emergency rooms in Camden with very high sugars. Our nurses went out to meet the patient and asked to watch the patient use their insulin. And the patient put a needle in the bottle, pulled up 50 cc's of air, and went to inject it into his arm. And it turns out that he was blind, partly blind, sight impaired, and couldn't see what he was doing. And in fact, even if you have perfect vision, it can be hard to drop insulin. He went to the refrigerator and he pulled out two bags of little insulin bottles, and he said, the pharmacy keeps bringing me refills, and I can't seem to empty the bottles. Those are the kind of failures happening in your family, in my family, in families all over the country. You don't need to be poor to have these kind of healthcare failures going on. It's costing us a lot of money. So we're gonna further segment here. And, and one of the themes in, in our work in Camden is bringing the last 100 years of brilliance in the business world of how to think about doing things more efficiently and more effectively over into healthcare. So what I'm gonna show you is um, about uh, about three to four years ago, I literally brought this slide. Anthony, you can back me up here. And, and stood in the first floor of Northgate 2 and showed the slide. And it was probably the most fun I've ever had because it's so rare to have a chance when you've been working with a data set to go out and meet the people in the data set. And I said to everyone in the building, um, I don't know what's going on here. I've got some thoughts about this. I'm a family doctor. I've got an office. Many of you know who I am. I think something's really broken. And I want to tell you how much your healthcare costs. And do you guys feel like you got $12 million worth of care? And Anthony, I think everyone in the building couldn't believe that someone made that much money and they felt so unwell and so disrespected. So Anthony, I'm going to stop for a second. Do you want to, here's your chance, do you want to chime in? I didn't feel like I had an opportunity to, to receive $12 million in um, health care over the last year. And I had been using the emergency room. But, I'm, and I'm so happy that you um, pointed that out because I remember that, that day that you came in and you presented your slides from your PowerPoint and you explained about the health care um, broken system in the city of Camden. And I, I was just so excited that now I'm again excited to, to hear you continue on with um, your statement, follow up on what you started some uh, seven to eight years ago, if I remember correctly. <laughs> <laughs> Fixing broken systems is a long, <laughs> a long journey. Um, so 
what, what came out of that discussion was a whole lot of brainstorming with residents and partnering with a group called Camden Churches Organized for People using classic community organizing to find out from the customer, the consumer, and the residents what, what was driving all of this. We learned a tremendous amount, and I came back to my staff and I said, I don't care how much it costs, I want us to throw everything in the kitchen sink, anything anyone has ever thought of, to actually bend the cost curve in this building and help residents get better care. Because if you can't bend the cost curve and improve quality in one building, you'll never do it at the whole community level. So we began to do things like the Stanford chronic disease model, we did diabetic education, we did um, uh, exercise classes, uh, dance classes, we did art therapy, we did group therapy, we did anything we could think of. One of our board members, who's a private Medicaid practice, agreed to open a two exam room office on the first floor, thinking that, you know, let's bring everything to this building, because in the end, people just need to come down the elevator, and in the, you know, this will be what, what fixes the problem. So I'm now three years later, and I can tell you we still haven't figured it out. So it turns out that we knew, um, in data terms, we knew the numerator, we didn't know the denominator. I knew how many people were going to the hospital. I didn't know how many people weren't going to the hospital. That turns out to be even more important. So let me show you why. This is a segmentation concept. This is sort of breaking out into four categories, the folks that live in the building. And through our collaboration with the building, we were able to get the list of everyone who lives in the building and match that to the billing data from this clinic and match that to the hospital data from the entire city. That's very unusual. And what we learned is that people fall out into basically four categories. This is cluster analysis, a non-linear way of thinking about the data. There are uh, people who never or very rarely go to the hospital and emergency room. There are medium emergency room utilizers who have two to three emergency room visits in a year. There are high emergency room utilizers who have eight emergency room visits in a year and one inpatient visit. And there are high inpatient utilizers who on average have three inpatient visits and one ED visit. So let me show you what the building looks like. These are the subgroups in the building. All the blue are the folks that never or rarely ever go to the emergency room or hospital. The highest cost, most complex hotspot in the city are one of them. The vast majority of the folks in the building aren't using the ER hospital, that there's essentially a hotspot within the hotspot. Can you imagine Procter & Gamble doing what I had just done? When Procter & Gamble, when Walmart, when, when the engines of capitalism want to figure out how to meet your needs, you the customer, they segment the marketplace. The clothes that you're wearing, the car you drove today to work, the food you shopped for yesterday are not accidents. Someone knows exactly what your tastes are, what you like to buy, and then through very careful thought, there is a factory that delivers highly precise products very high quality and relatively low cost to exactly your demographic segment so that you get your needs met. We don't do that in healthcare. In my primary care office, I had a, a jumble of people and I delivered a disorganized jumble of services every day that were unreliable. And some days what I did was amazing and a lot of days what I did was mediocre and it was exhausting and it was unsustainable. So we need to use the tools of capitalism, segmentation. So this is nonlinear. Your biostats and epi people don't like segmentation. It's a very messy way of looking at data. Because what you have to do first is you develop a hypothesis, you do the analysis, then you got to go out and talk to everyone and say, does this make any sense? And then you have to go back and refine your hypothesis. So what we found out is that there were 122 people, 20% of the building, were medium emergency room utilizers. An emergency room visit's about $1,000. That's not that expensive. 3% um, uh, were high ED utilizers. Uh, 21 patients were um, high inpatient utilizers. That essentially, there were about 15 folks in the building that were driving much of the cost and much of the utilization, but they are very isolated. They don't come out of their rooms. They're not going to come down and participate in our programs. They are in and out of the hospital all the time. They feel isolated, scared, they feel alone. And our traditional methods of reaching them aren't gonna work. You know, these are your chronically homeless patients who have been living on the streets for years and years in your data set, your extreme outliers that are hard to reach. 
These are a similar kind of group in the sense that you have to use different methods and different ways of thinking and different mental models to figure out how to reach them, how to touch them, how to engage them. We're still figuring this out. What we've decided to do, one of our tools in Camden is a health information exchange where every moment, every day, data streams in and we get uh, demographics, labs, radiology results, and hospital discharge summaries. So I know in real time when anyone is admitted in the city and where they're from. So we now deploy our uh, care coordinators, our nurses, right to the bedside to meet them at the bedside and then follow them back out. We had the wrong tool for the wrong job. So the fix to this wasn't necessarily a primary care office. It was a care coordination nurse meeting you at the bedside and then tracking you back out. Now, there's nothing wrong with a primary care office in a, in a building like this, conceptually. But a couple of things. One, if you are older, sicker, and more disabled, you probably have a primary care provider that you've been seeing for many years. And even if they're hard to use and difficult to get in with, at least you know them. You have some relationship with them. So getting folks in the building who are very sick and very disabled to switch their primary care provider was a huge barrier. And that makes complete sense. That would be like calling up your grandmother or your mom and trying to get them to switch primary care providers, you know, and, and they've known the person for years, they know the office, they know the front desk people. Older folks don't like to change, you know, they've, they've gotten used to something. The other problem is that even if everyone in the building switched to the primary care office, there's not a business model yet for that. In other words, the way we pay for healthcare, there aren't enough patients in the building to fully support that office, which means now you have, you have part-time staff and who wants to go to an office with part-time staff? So there are a lot of challenges to making a business model out of this. So the you know, further ways of doing segmentation, this is looking in the entire city of Camden at the top 1% of high inpatient utilizers. It's 200 patients, breaking them out into categories, understanding where they live, understanding the drivers. This is very different than how we typically use healthcare data. And this allows you to do health planning and uh, more thoughtfully target resources. We've taken a similar analytic frame and begun to look at other data sets around the country. First of all, I want to tell you that all of the data that I'm showing you for the last 10 years has lived on two $50 hard drives with open source encryption, password protection, sitting inside of a $100 safe under a desk using a desktop computer with Microsoft Access and ArcView GIS and a really talented 25-year-old. So this is big data, right? <laughs> big data doesn't mean big vendor cost. So how we do big data is we buy expensive systems and spend lots of money on vendors. So this is not expensive stuff at all. This is uh, looking at Newark's data, collecting data from the local hospitals in Newark, found similar patterns of complex, high-cost patients living in buildings I suspect you guys probably fund. This is up in Maine. We got a hold of um, collaborating with the state of Maine, a few counties' data sets, and we mapped them out. And it turned out that their high-cost, complex patients mapped down to buildings in towns. You know, they wouldn't let us show you, but there are actually buildings in these towns where all this maps down to. It turns out that as you get older and sicker in a rural community, it's hard to live in the middle of nowhere. You end up getting slowly collected up into towns. We rank ordered all the towns of Maine, sounds like a book or a movie, right? <laughs> By the number of high utilizers, the percentage of high utilizers living in their town. Because something's wrong with that town. Something's wrong with their civic capacity, with their social capital, that they're not taking care of their most vulnerable citizens well. These are just indicators of disorganization and fragmentation in their service delivery, of the gaps between behavioral health, addiction, housing, their churches, and, and how they've knit their social fabric together. So this could be your mom or your grandmother or a family member. This is a CAT scan of a patient who is middle class, who went over and over to a five hospital, highly integrated delivery system that's completely connected by electronic health records. This patient went back and had 54 admissions over a couple of year period, 147 CAT scans, and 73 CAT scans of the head. This patient's lifetime risk of radiation has increased because of the number of CAT scans. 
So my point of this slide is to, to tell you that this is not a poverty story. You thought you were coming today to hear about the poor city in America and all of its problems, but this is the story of healthcare in America, and it's the story of how we've constructed our healthcare system, the norms and rules we've created, how we train our providers, how we separated out and ruined behavioral health and addiction, how we took social work and split it out and disempowered it. This is the, this is the mess that we've created that 85 million baby boomers are headed to. And many of you have probably had family members caught up in the system. So it turned out that this patient just had anxiety. And a group of family medicine residents, trainees who were hotspotting, went out and found this outlier case. They had a, a psychologist that works in their program get involved and work with this patient. And this patient stopped going to the emergency room for anxiety and getting repeated CAT scans. So IT won't, health IT is not going to fix this. Health IT is not going to fix this. ACOs are not going to fix this. The Affordable Care Act is not going to figure this out completely. It's headed in the right direction. This is a deep cultural problem with how we've put the system together, and even the language and the words that we're using. Um, I want to give you an example of a case, the kind of patients that we work with. This is a 55-year-old male admitted for GI bleed and shortness of breath. This is a dual eligible patient living in a high rise. In six months, had nine emergency room visits and six inpatient visits. Patients on 12 medicines a day, has kidney failure, kidney cancer, hepatitis B, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, blockages in his arteries, asthma, glaucoma, sleep apnea, and severe back pain. This is the patient in the middle, and these are all the services that are, are not connecting with this kind of patient. Patient was picked up by our teams in hospital number one, went out to subacute rehab, got readmitted to hospital number two, needed to coordinate home nursing, home PT and OT, transport meals, durable medical goods, dialysis, nephrology, transplant. Primary care provider had to coordinate ophthalmology, pain management, GI, cardiology, urology, oncology, and surgery. We should be really proud of this. This is a sign of success of the biomedical model. The Hill-Burton Act, the NIH, all of the federal money invested in increasing and empowering and creating the, the infrastructure in America that can do things for people and save lives. This is, this is the graph of it. This is the visual representation of that. The problem is that we haven't caught up to what we created. All that complexity, we haven't caught up to how we manage all that complexity, how we coordinate, how we prioritize. We've got a lot of work to do to catch up to the great thing that we funded and created. None of these circles are trained in a way to know how to talk to one another. Our laws don't allow this data to move around easily. Um, our payment models actually discourage collaboration. We'll put them out of business if, we if they collaborate in the kind of ways that you want them to. These are the crazy piles of medicines you find in people's homes. And uh, this is the patient. His name is Glenn. His primary care provider works in an FQHC on the left, Federally Qualified Health Center. In the middle is Corinne. Corinne was an AmeriCorps volunteer who spent a year with us working as a health coach and worked very, very closely with this patient to help navigate, accompany him, and walk through the healthcare system with him. And on the right is Jason Torrey, who works very, very closely with Corinne. We have 10 AmeriCorps volunteers a year who work as health coaches who are embedded with our teams, and they're all going on to med school and nursing school and public health school. Some are becoming healthcare administrators. So they are my secret weapons to one day <laughs> Fix healthcare. So this is um, one of your patients. So somewhere down the line, a dollar coming from HUD had a huge impact on this patient's life. This is a 58-year-old patient who um, let us share his story with you. Uh, Medicaid covered, homeless for 20 years, lacks family support, can't um, obviously can't manage meds. Uh, lots of challenges in his life. Asthma, diabetes, high blood pressure, high cholesterol, depression. And our teams meet our patients right in the hospital, follow them out, in this case to the shelter, work with all the services. We don't want to duplicate the services. We want to pull the services together. And we managed to get this patient into um, really a housing first model. Um, and let me show you what happens. So this is the patient's claims data from the three local hospitals. Uh, the first star is when the patient was engaged. So on the left is um, the number of hospitalizations that month. So as you walk along, these are tick lines. So the patient had two visits in a month, 
a little bit longer. The blue ones are ER visits, the red lines are inpatient visits. Um, I'm sorry, the time didn't, the months didn't come out on this. Uh, it, this is about a, uh, a one year period that you're looking at here. Um, we engaged the patient and the hospitalizations went up. When we finally got the patient into housing, the hospitalizations went away. So I don't think I need to tell everyone in the room here, housing is the best pill. It's the best scan. It's more powerful than surgery. You know, if we're not housing these patients, they will get sicker, older, and die. And they will cost a lot of money in the process. We're wasting so much money. I know there's so many impediments to looking at these buckets of money and thinking about how they affect one another, but that's what we need to do. We have inherited utterly obsolete systems in education, in housing, in healthcare, in education, in policing. And the job of all of us in the room is to modernize all these systems. We're very far behind in doing that. This is the daily kind of data that comes out every day for us through our health information exchange. Um, this is a citywide hospital census. So I want to close with the last slide. Our theory of change in our work, and I think probably um, people like Dennis Culhane um, and, and others that are trying to fix systems are are probably using similar theories, that you need three things to fix broken things in healthcare. You've got had a deep engagement. For us, engagement is community organizing, it's change management, it's motivational interviewing, it's dialectical behavioral therapy, it's like different ways of thinking and engaging with people, um, with systems, with stakeholders, within systems. It's redesign. This is box by box redesign of workflows. This is lean thinking. This is what manufacturing did to become a more efficient, more effective, and lots and lots and lots of data moving around in real time. We're pretty far away from pulling all that off. Doing all three of those things simultaneously is incredibly challenging, and I think really the task of all of us as we go forward. So let me stop there and let's take some questions. Your discussion relates to Camden. Contiguous uh, nearby is Mount Laurel. Across the river to the west is the city of Philadelphia, and overarching is Campbell Soup. Mm -hmm. What did you find with respect to frequency or value of services that are provided in Camden that are not provided next door in Mount Laurel where they are seeking housing. So, so let me fill in a few gaps there, and probably you all know this history better than I do, which is um, Mount Laurel was the litigant as part of a very famous lawsuit called the Mount Laurel Decision, in which uh, New Jersey municipalities were using zoning to discriminate against poor um, uh, minorities that had been living in that township for many years. The impact of that was a Supreme Court decision twice in New Jersey, which resulted in the requirement of set-asides for affordable housing. Um, the Mount Laurel housing is beautiful, um, and the many patients that I have that live out there, and staff even, um, ended up with um, much better quality of life and lots of opportunity. The issue about uh, uh, geographic concentration of services I've heard many people in Camden say that um, it's unfair that Camden has the burden of, of housing services for the homeless, of behavioral health services, addiction services, um, and that they're being dumped on by, by six counties away. And my response to that has always been, look, years and years and years ago, Camden was the epicenter of culture, of commerce, of transportation, of services, ideas. And if you want to return to being the epicenter of those things, then it's OK to be the epicenter of the best housing services in the region and the best behavioral health services in the region. But let's also be the epicenter of lots of great ideas, of great education, and other things. So, um, so I think inherent in your comments is really about are other municipalities providing services that people need, and do they have geographic distribution of this? 
you know, we could debate this all day, but um, there are a certain category of people that um, probably benefit from um, denser collection of services to be able to access those services. It's hard to imagine a recently released offender living out on the far end of the county in an extremely isolated spot, not being able to move around. Um, you know, I, I, th I think these are much bigger questions than, than what I'm addressing, but your question is very germane and an important question, probably bigger than I can answer. One aspect of your answer that I was seeking a comment on is the role of the corporate employer in other communities where they provide or assist in providing housing. I think that corporations' job is to maximize their profit, profits, serve their shareholders' needs, and then to be good corporate citizens in that order. And that's what they are. Because if they don't do that, they go out of business. I think it's the job of government to answer the citizenry and to mediate between corporations and the citizenry. Um, and that system broke down in Camden. You know, we don't have good governance or haven't had it and there's been an imbalance of power. So I, I think it's very unfair to put the burden of where Camden is right now on any specific corporation or to hold the duty of that corporation up to be anything more than frankly the duty of New Jersey and the duty of the federal government. You know, the biggest failures in Camden are how public services that are currently receiving funding are delivered in inadequate ways that are poorly organized. And that's not the fault of Campbell Soup. That's the fault of city government and state government. We just fired our entire police department. It's the best thing we ever did in Camden. And they had to reapply for their jobs. Um, good afternoon. Thank you for your talk, Dr. Brenner. Um, my name is Sydney Fong. I'm an Emerson National Hunger Fellow at um, the Office of Refugee Resettlement in um, the Department of Human or Health and Human Services. Mm -hmm. and. Um, my, my question is about um, the work that you might have done to engage um, community benefit spending to mm -hmm. support the work that you're doing, or um, can you speak to the potential for community benefits to, um, to support the, the work? So that's a great question, and built into that question is the idea that in the Affordable Care Act, there was a requirement that hospitals on their 990, their tax form, have to report their community benefit spending, and they also have to do a community plan, a needs assessment and needs plan. I wish it were that easy to fix the healthcare system. It's idealistic, it was a, a noble idea, but you know, uh, hospitals have to pay their bills, and the way that they pay their bills based on the rules that we created is to fill their beds. And the way that they fill their beds is by having big emergency rooms that are well lit that can get lots of people in them. And uh, they are like the airline industry and the hotel industry, which is it's their profits, their profit margin is based on occupancy rates. The profit margin of the hospital industry is razor thin. If you want to open a business or invest in a business, you know, hospitals are not very profitable businesses. So um, I think it's putting an undue burden on hospitals to fix this because one part of government is saying fix it, the other part of government has built a payment system and funded a payment system that the only way they can stay in business is to fill their beds. So you're asking them to go extinct. You're putting a gun to their head saying on this, you know, we want you to spend your money to empty your beds. We want you to spend money to go out of business. That's essentially what we've asked them to do through the community benefit in the 990. So I've heard um, Susan Dresner say we need a reverse Hill-Burton Act you know, these, you know, we have a capacity problem. We have too much capacity. We could probably throw, close a third of our hospitals if we did this right, maybe even more. But it's like base closings, you know, like every community fights to keep their hospital open because they're jobs. So, uh, so thank you for the question. I think it's a very reasonable one. I don't think community benefits and 990s are going to get us where we want to be. Thank you. Um, we have a question from the field. Peggy Johansson from Multifamily Housing Program Center in Miami. Um, she said, first, my friend Marcy Nielsen says hello and told me to listen to you because you know what you're talking about. <laughs> and she asks, as we in HUD field offices work with communities to revitalize an area economically, 
What do you see the role of the healthcare system being in that? For example, should we encourage clinics or medical practices to open in these areas or focus on businesses that employ more people as long as the city's transportation system to existing health healthcare facilities is reliable and accessible? You know, the, what's most interesting is I don't have the answer to those questions, and I don't think anyone does. And, you know, you guys have the NIH is here in D.C. The, you guys have a research office. You know, our work is experimental work. I mean, this is deep R&D. And it's kind of scary to think that we actually don't know how to deliver better care at lower cost, but it's true. Let me say it again. We don't know how to deliver better care at lower cost, but we spend 18% of our economy delivering care. So um, I think we're way behind on some really elemental questions. I'll give you a small example. The whole um, healthcare industry, the insurance company's model, has been to figure out, use predictive modeling, and guess who's getting sicker, and then have a nurse in a cubicle call them on a phone. I mean, I kind of wonder, having nurses in cubicles calling homeless people with no phones, how effective that model's going to be, and why we need predictive modeling when sick people are lying in hospital beds all over America. I have found them very easily just walking up and down the hospital hall. So, you know, we don't need fancy predictive modeling algorithms to find out where the sickest patients are. They're actually spending a lot of time in the hospital. So, um, you know, we believe that you get most of the savings from working with the sickest patients and bringing them down towards wellness rather than working with healthy people who are getting sicker. You know, there are a lot of people who prefer to work with healthy people. You know, they're easier to work with. They're more cooperative. They show up at your program. It's a lot harder to work with sick people. I don't know if you're going to have an answer to this either. I'm Linda Bronston, the Public Housing Policy Office. But in my life outside of HUD, I work with a uh, what used to be a free medical clinic. Um, and it was for 20 years, it's been volunteer doctors and volunteer nurses and a very finite number of patients. That was the problem, mm -hmm. was that it was a closed list of people who could be served. We're now going to be a Medicaid provider with the desire to have a full-time nurse but from what I'm hearing, we may not be able to afford, I mean, we, wouldn't, we won't be doing what we have been doing, which has been providing good, good medical care. Do you have any other hope? <laughs> <laughs> the answer is yes. Yeah. <laughs> you're, you're right. Yeah. <laughs> you know, we, we need to change our payment model and how we pay for the stuff. We also need to redistribute dollars. You know, so when everything is said and done, there's only one way to deliver better care at lower cost. These are gonna be really global statements. We will close hospitals and shift dollars from inpatient beds back into the community. Does that kind of sound familiar? There's no other systems that have had that problem, right? From acute care to community-based services. We will also shift dollars from specialty care and very technical services back towards primary care and even beyond primary care to old school community nursing and community social work. We will also shift money from medical to behavioral health and addiction spending, and then we'll further shift money towards, I think, probably housing spending as well if we do this right. So those are you kind know, of the broad trends in all this. Getting from here to there, it makes me want to go hide in Camden. <laughs> Hi, Jeff. Seiji Hayashi from the Health Resources and Services Administration. Um, for those of you in the room, um, I'm the Chief Medical Officer for the um, Bureau of Primary Healthcare, where we run the Community Health Center program. So we have now 1,300 organizations that we fund that operate close to 10,000 clinics across the United States. 240 or so of these grantees um, provide healthcare for the homeless. Only about 60 provide um, housing, uh, primary care and housing developments. One of the challenges that you know, we're facing is how do you partner fairly qualified health centers and housing? You know, and we've been talking about this um, for a while. And the challenges are you know, sometimes bureaucratic, sometimes you know, sort of person personal mm -hmm. and interpersonal. Um, if we are able to get more health centers partnering with housing developments mm -hmm. and housing programs, you've talked about sort of uh, a coalescence of certain types of programs and services. What are the most essential services that need to be together with primary care? So there's a wonderful book called The Healthcare Paradox that was just written by um, researchers up at Harvard. And what they, it's kind of obvious once I say this, 
If you look at all um, developed countries in the world at their healthcare spending, we're way above the average of everyone else. We're twice as much as the average. If you look at social service spending, we're below. If you combine them and you add up medical spend and social service spend, we're actually, we're in the middle of that group. If you make a ratio of the two and ask, how much do we spend on medical spend compared to social service spend compared to all these countries? It turns we're way off the chart. In other words, we're, we're medicalizing human and social problems. So what are really behavioral health, addiction, and social problems, we're medicalizing. So I, I think, you know, when you think about what should be in a primary care setting, this isn't rocket science. There are people all over the country doing incredible work about integration of addiction and behavioral health services. There are very good evidence-based models that are evolving. There are so many barriers to, to this that you guys in government are going to have to solve. A small taste of this is that um, the state licensing around what it would take to get an extension of your um, federally qualified health center into a public housing has to do with like square footage issues and lights and you know the licensing issues are huge impediments. Um, I also think that many of our FQHCs are too small and many of our housing agencies are too small. Many of our behavioral and addiction agencies are too small. And we're gonna have to start sending out a message that you guys need to merge and consolidate and have scale and size because you know it's very hard to partner if you're, you know, you don't have the fixed cost and the infrastructure to even keep the lights on. So you know, mom and pop shops in healthcare are um, a kind of an antiquated notion, I think, and probably not going to make it. My office shouldn't make it two to the future, because there's no way a little office with three exam rooms can deliver your family the really modern, well-organized care that you deserve. Can ever get electronic and do all the things that we need to do. I don't think a small housing agency can pull off housing first. I don't think a small addiction agency can modernize and trauma-informed care. So, you know, I think there's things that you guys can do to message out that all these mom and pop things need to start to merge and consolidate so that they can actually handle partnerships. Because every time you partner, it's like, it's pretty hard work, right? I mean, you gotta have a lot of infrastructure and people to manage, project manage that partnership and move it beyond just intention. So I think those are small, small pieces. Great, thank you. Yeah. Uh, we have another question from Mara Blitzer. She's our senior policy advisor in multifamily um, here at HUD. She said, I'm wondering about the building-specific hotspot analysis you gave as an example. What steps did it take to get the data you needed to identify the people who are most in need of health interventions, and are there privacy or coordination issues? So HIPAA is not an impediment to all of this. Um, HIPAA is a cultural impediment, but not a legal impediment. So when people don't want to work with you, they use HIPAA. But when they do want to work with you, HIPAA's not a problem. So it took me a little while to realize that. <laughs> so um, you know, HIPAA says that you can sign very specific kinds of legal agreements where you've got specific kinds of purposes to do that um, for specific reasons to data share. And nothing that you've seen today I didn't break the federal law. I'm here to tell you that I didn't break the federal law. <laughs> <laughs> so, um, you know, the impediments to this are often um, trust, relationship building, and, um, and longevity. I mean, I've been in Camden 15 years. It takes a lot of trust for someone to turn over their data to you. Um, look, you guys are sitting on all this data, right? Like, you could have done what I've done years ago. Um, we would love if you guys would share some of your Camden housing data with us so we could figure out how all this works. Um, so I'm extending an arm to all of you in the room, the data people here, to help me figure out how to sign a business associate agreement with HUD to do data sharing to more comprehensively figure this out in Camden. Uh, Dr. Brenner, thank you so much. I'm Richard Cho with the U.S. Interagency Council on Homelessness. Um, I don't work at HUD, so I don't have any data for you. Um, <laughs> and I also want to apologize if I was distracting you because I was kind of jumping up and down in my seat as you were, you were presenting. Um, this is really validating for those of us who've been working to end homelessness for many years because I think uh, especially the idea that housing first and permanent supportive housing is really part of the solution here. Yeah. And I think what I took away from your presentation is really that the solution really is maybe comprised of three things. It's it's really good quality health care and that, that the diagram with all the circles really illustrates that. It, housing is part of the solution, mm -hmm. as we, we all know. But I think the third part, um, which you talked about conversations, just engaging people. Um, yeah. We have a strategy for paying for the healthcare. We have a strategy for paying for housing. That involves 
a lot of this building. Mm -hmm. um, we don't have a convers we don't have a strategy for paying for the conversations. That 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 key part of the services that I think are really important. Yep. And I'm wondering if you think how do we bring this idea and intervention to scale if we can't figure out how to pay for that? So that's such a good question. So so let's I want to tear that. Uh, it's really a question of engagement, which is, um, you know, we have an obsolete mental model for what we do in healthcare, in housing, in education, in all these fields. So, you know, how do we engage one another in a new kind of dialogue? And that dialogue is going to be a public dialogue. Like, fundamentally, these are the only way to solve this kind of problem is to civically engage and have a public dialogue. Because in the end, we make the rules about how we want to live. And you know, we're going to increasingly be hurt by the rules and the systems we've created. So the first step to that is even realizing there's a problem and what the problem is. And right now, we don't even agree in healthcare on what the problem is. You know, like, I think that what I've said today is um, you know, a very clear framing of the problem with lots of clear examples. But we've had a lot of media coverage. We've had a lot of discussion about healthcare. But it always feels like it's like not quite the right problem we're talking about. You know, I liken it a little bit to going to a, um, uh, a car dealership and you've spent two hours with your spouse talking to the person telling you about the different ways you can finance the car. And you're arguing, no, I don't want to pay this percent, I want to do it this way, I want a, a 36 month lease and not a 30 month lease and on and on and on. And then you're like all worked up and you get back in your car and you're kind of mad and you don't even know why you're mad anymore and you're driving away and you're like, oh my God, we forgot to look at the cars. What do we want to buy? We're spending a lot of money. We never had a discussion about what we want to buy. What does good care look like, and what do you want to buy? What does good housing look like, and what do you want to buy? And we don't share a vision for that at all. So we'll never change the details of the rules unless we change our vision for what good care looks like fundamentally in housing and healthcare. Dr. Brenner, my name is Len Clay, I work at HUD, and I don't have data for you either. <laughs> but I do have the experience in working with low-income populations in public housing. And some of the issues that you've spoken about are issues that we also address. But I wanted to uh, cut to the chase on another level, and that is social impact bonds. Mm -hmm. How would you package it if you were trying to sell the idea of what you do yep. to the private market to be used in public housing authorities yep. so, so that residents could uh, work with physicians and hospitals to do the kind of work that we're talking about. That's How, a, what would it look like? What would the steps look that's like? That's a great question. So for those of you who don't know, social impact bonds are the idea of um, having outside investors bring capital in to help fund the startup and delivery of a service. If the service stays the state or federal government money, that they're able to recapture a dividend, a, a, a portion of the savings back. I think the problem with that is the language of bond. So the language of a bond requires that you know what you're doing. <laughs> <laughs> and I'm going to say it here publicly. We don't know what we're doing in Camden. We're an R&D shop, and we're really way out on a limb exploring new stuff. We're about to launch a randomized controlled trial because it's taken us a really long time to kind of figure out the it. And you know, in a, hopefully in a year, I'll be able to give you a much better sense of exactly what the return on investment would be. I would never buy a bond for something where you have no idea what the return on investment is. And that's kind of true with a lot of the things that social impact bonds are being discussed is that some of the stuff is really cutting edge stuff where we don't know necessarily what the recidivism rate is for prison return. And we don't, you know, it's gotta be something where you, you know what the data is, you know what the intervention is, you've had many trials of delivering it, so bonds, the expectation of the word bond is a stable return where there's not a lot of volatility, unless you're doing crazy junk bonds. But you know, I think we're way back up the chain. This is be like a stock, like a penny stock. <laughs> <laughs> so well, I, I, look, I think we have to get capitalism into this because capitalism scales better than the nonprofit community. So there is a role for public-private. We were talking at lunch today that my favorite example of public-private partnership in a poor community, and one of the only examples I know of that works, is um, CDCs, Community Development Corporations, partnering with a private housing developer. And there's a good balance of power there. And uh, the CDC plays the role of like planning the project, 
securing the land, making all the partnerships, working with the community around the community benefit. And then the private developer does what they do well, which is put up housing. So, you know, somehow we don't do that very well with things like Medicaid transportation, with Medicaid managed care, like our other vendor models for privatization are not going as well as that model. Dr. Brenner, I'm Paul Kimmel. I'm a nephrologist at NIH, and we've already dissed these two uh, areas, so. And I'm still standing. <laughs> and you're still smiling. Um, so uh, actually, another question that I had would be, I think it would be great if you describe to us later the randomized control trial that you're talking about, because I think that would be very useful for people who are interested in policy, housing, and physicians. Yep. You spent a beautiful amount of time talking about inequality of distribution of services. And we have a similar problem with income that I've heard about. Uh, so it's a, it's a resonant idea. But the healthcare system underwent a huge change 40 years ago that you may have mentioned because you used behavioral a lot rather than psychiatric, which is a more medicalized term. Mm -hmm. And we changed the system of uh, psychiatric hospitals to community health services. Yep. And we put um, a lot of, uh, I think, very ill people into the streets, into homes, into communities. Uh, and we don't have good systems like with TB care to mm -hmm. ensure that there is medication adherence. And I liked your analysis, you know, focusing on that 1% or mm -hmm. the one-tenth of 1%. One you must know how many people in that one-tenth, 1%, one have a psychiatric diagnosis, because I think that's probably the critical thing. You're going to the emergency room maybe because it's warm, but you don't do that in the summer. Yep. But you might go 400 times a year because you have a severe psychiatric diagnosis. Yeah. And by the way, I think the CAT scan was abnormal. It was. <laughs> <laughs> there were uh, 79, slight, 79 abnormal. <laughs> um, so a couple of great questions there and sort of elements. One is, uh, we've been here before in behavioral health. Our colleagues in uh, uh, one third of state budgets were psychiatric hospitals at one point. And because of the agitation of patients and their families and advocates, lawsuits, and the growing recognition that it was really um, an unethical and not a good delivery model, we made a decision to essentially deinstitutionalize psychiatric care. That's what we're about to do now with medical care. And I hope that we don't make all the same mistakes because we deinstitutionalize psychiatric care without really building, building out the services on the outside. Our colleagues over in behavioral health and addiction, I think, have done a brilliant, brilliant job of making up for that mess. And they have an incredible tiered system of very boots on the ground, very wraparound service that I think is a model for everything we need to do on the, on the medical side. So our team outreach program looks very identical to an ACT team, assertive community treatment which is a high-risk um, wraparound model for uh, often long-term institutionalized psychiatric patients. Uh, it also looks like a PACE program, which is a wraparound model for geriatric high-risk dual eligibles. Um, you know, we have lots of these wraparound supportive housing models. When you pull them all apart, they actually look very similar. They have a lot of similar elements to them. The other piece that I want to call out here is, um, how many of you are aware of the literature for adverse childhood experiences, ACE literature? So um, about the same number of hands in every room I've ever been in um, raise, except um, hospital executives have not heard of any of this, and doctors haven't heard of it, but social workers, nurses, and you guys have, so some of you. This is extremely important work that has not been talked about at all. It stems back from a study that was done by a guy named Vincent Folitti. He's a physician at Kaiser Permanente 15 years ago. He sent out a survey to 17,000 middle-class patients that were Kaiser Permanente patients, 70% of them returned the survey. That's a very high return rate. And he asked them about the horrible stuff that happened to them in their childhood. Death of a parent, physical abuse, sexual abuse, uh, neglect. And then they agreed to have it connected to their medical records. Can you imagine? 70% agreed. What, he gave a point for each of the adverse childhood events. And if you add up those points, more than 50% of this baby boomer middle class population had at least one um, one of these things. It didn't tell you how many times it happened, but they had one of those things happen. And it predicted better than anything we've ever found an incredible array of variables. Health spending, health utilization, 
smoking, alcoholism, substance abuse, poorly controlled chronic illness, early pregnancy, a whole variety of variables. This is a hypothesis that's incredibly powerful. Underlying this is the idea that if you expose a child in utero or in early childhood to incredible stress, they are fundamentally rewired and changed. That in some ways, it's kind of almost a form of, of, um, of permanent brain damage, the things that you've done to them, and you hamper them the rest of their lives. And those are your folks that you see as chronically homeless, that are the hardest to reach. The wiring and the systems of building trust and stable relations with people have been permanently damaged. So, you know, the one thing that links all of our social systems together is this hypothesis. And I've heard a very talented person named Sandy Bloom, who you should invite in the future, say that uh, this is as important as the germ theory or a lot of other foundational theories because it links every part of HUD together with HHS, with all the other parts of government, because we're dealing with a profoundly large population of people who were deeply damaged as children, and then they go off in different directions. Some go to criminal justice, some come over to HUD, some end up in the emergency room and hospital over and over, and they end up over in HHS. I don't mean they work for HUD. And <laughs> <laughs> so thank you for the couple of points you made. You know, what's interesting is all over the country, what we're finding are there is a place in the world for schizophrenics that a lot of our folks have, have actually um, personality disorders, which are lifelong impairments that are increasingly being recognized as outgrowths of early life trauma. And they often get misdiagnosed as bipolar disorder, and they get quieted down with benzos and uh, antipsychotics because it'll, it'll tone them down and sort of quiet them down. Uh, so thank you for the question. Um, I'm Peter Ashley in uh, the office of HUD's Office of Healthy Homes. Thanks for being with us today. Sure. Um, my first question is, uh, what do you think uh, the potential is of the medical home concept under the Affordable Care Act for delivering higher quality, more integrated care? Um, the second question is um, uh, your thoughts on community health workers uh, we've had some grants for asthma interventions mm -hmm. in homes, and we found them to be uh, quite effective and at, a, at a lower cost and, and can communicate a lot of times with, uh, with the residents let's better take, than, than others. Let's take the second one first because it's really easy. Yes, <laughs> which is um, tremendous amounts of this work can be delegated, and it's really powerful when you delegate it to people who have deep familiarity with the community and the, the families and the circumstances. So. That's an incredibly powerful model that we really don't know yet in America how to fully figure out. It's hard to run good community health worker programs, and it's hard to scale them. But we need to figure that out. Um, but we've, we have seen the power of it in our work, and many of our colleagues around the country have seen the power of it as well. You can definitely hire very expensive nurses and social workers and have them do this, but you need their wisdom, but a lot of the, the follow-up work can be delegated. So we need to figure out how to build teams, and teams are complicated, hard to build. The second part is a really hard one to answer because it's my tribe that came up with the idea of patients in a medical home. You know, it really came out of pediatrics and family medicine, really originally pediatrics, and, and family medicine later strongly embraced it. The problem with the patients in a medical home is that we rushed it out of the lab without having any idea what we were doing. Then we slapped a, um, a, a standard on it without any idea what worked, and then we certified it, and then we created a payment model for it without any idea what we were paying for. So that's a pretty big problem, right? So, so let me be clear. If you look at the list of, of, of broad level goals for patient center medical home, it's like more coordinated care, it's patient centeredness, totally on the same page. But how they actually implement that in the checklist, you could be a level three medical home, patting yourself on the back, getting a bump of $3 PM PM, which is $3 per person per month, which isn't enough to do anything with, and still delivering the same crappy care, running from room to room to room, ignoring your sickest patients. So there's something fundamentally wrong with that. It should, in fact, studies are now emerging that very few patients in medical homes save money. They do increase quality slightly, but um, a patient in a medical home should mean that you wake up in the morning and you fundamentally, your entire office operates differently. 
every role, every activity, every data element, every workflow are so profoundly different that you wouldn't even recognize it. That's disruptive change. Patient-centered medical home was poorly imp implemented um, incremental change. Hi, I'm Bill Reed. I'm an economist in policy development and research. And I have a question that was touched on <clears throat> by a couple of the other people, which is what fraction of the benefits that you're getting by um, implementing your system would you attribute to um, better provision of mental health services? So we don't have that data. The only thing I have right now is um, claims data from the hospital. So I have inpatient spending and I have emergency room spending. I don't have any of the behavioral health, the addiction data. Um, so I don't know the answer. Um, you know, I think that 100% of our patients who are in that top 1% have some form of uh, a behavioral health challenge, some category. Um, and it won't show up in the, in the data. Like, you won't find it in the ICD-9 codes for a lot of these folks. You know, we're not sensitive to the stuff in the medical system. We don't know how to pick it up. We don't focus on it. We try and ignore it. So, um, you know, I think what this calls out is there is so much research. You know, the HRSA folks, the NIH folks, you know, we're not, if we're not funding research in the right kind of ways. We're not asking the right questions, I don't think. The field, there, right now we talk about population health as a field. It doesn't exist. The field of population health right now has all these words that don't mean anything. And that's the definition of a field that doesn't yet exist. So population health is an amalgam. It's a consilient field that involves business thinking, systems engineering, psychology, sociology, economics, anthropology. And it's really hard to figure all this stuff out. I think it's delivering better care at lower cost every day for everyone and prioritizing things that have a double bottom line where you both reduce cost and improve quality. But we're really far away from really having a field of that. The number of randomized controlled trials, which is the gold standard in um, population health, is very low. That's why I keep saying, like, there's foundational questions that we have no idea about. What are the right segments? What are the right buckets? How do we figure out how to build what's called a focused factory, which is a high reliable, highly structured intervention with clear roles and responsibilities for each of those segments? That's the task of the next 20 years. So I'll give you an example of a focused factory. An ACT team is a focused factory. Your supportive housing model and a lot of your housing first are focused factories. A uh, Ryan White clinic, an HIV clinic is a focused factory. Nurse Family Partnership is a focused factory. They each are responsive in delivering services to a very specific market niche or segment in the healthcare system. You know, some of you want to go running out of the room, right? I'm using the language of capitalism and market-driven systems. You know, that's what we need to do. We need to bring all those techniques into how we organize services. It's a great place to stop. Thanks. Thank you. Thank you so much. That's right. That's right. All right, Dr. Brenner, you did not disappoint. I want to thank everybody in the HUD field offices that organized to be able to watch this telecast today. I want to thank everybody uh, who came and participated in this conversation. This is a conversation uh, that is at its very beginning. And it's one that is so reliant on our, we at HUD, learning the, the language and the way the dollars work in the healthcare center, and having that conversation with you, our friends at HHS, and having it together with our friends at the Office of Management and Budget, and the folks up on the Hill. So we're looking forward to that conversation as we move forward. Thank you very much for coming today.